Hey guys, welcome to Page It Back, a book club book. No, nope, nailed it first time. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back to welcome to Page It Back, a book club podcast, where each month we read a fantasy or speculative paperback and see what we can learn about reading or writing. And I've nailed that right out of the gate. My name is David. My name is Laura. Uh, so the whole point of this podcast initially was we wanted to find an excuse to read books again, yeah, because um, we both been pretty <laughs> slack. And as a writer, that's something that I need to do. Um, so what, like, tell me a little bit about, like, your history with, like, reading and stuff. Like, what's drawn you to read as much as you do? Because I think you read almost as much as I do, which is a lot for most people. Well, it, it really, like, I don't always read a lot. It, it depends on if I can find time. Um, like, a lot, like, during uni, um, for a while, I wasn't reading at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, like... I started reading on ferries and then I stopped and it, it, it just goes back and forth as to whether I can find an excuse. Yes. And it's like the time and the reason. Yeah. I know what you mean. Um, but no, I've been reading a lot since I was very little. Yes. Um, yeah. And it's probably the reason that my spelling and grammar is so good. I wish I could say the same. I'm good with grammar, but I still can't spell for shit. <laughs> and I'm the author. Like I can't spell. I don't know what it is. That'll, that'll become a recurring theme as we go further into this podcast, because it does come up a lot. I mean, I, I do writing as well, but I haven't gotten to the point where I've... I mean, you you at least have a book out. I have a book out yeah. and a degree for it. So yeah. it's like, technically I should be on top of my shit, but I still can't spell. I, I'm more of a hobbyist in terms of writing. Yeah. But... So I wanted to let you guys know that this week we're talking about J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring, the first book in the series. Um... Also, someone said that I should uh, say his name, his full name, because no one ever does. It's John Ronald Raoul Tolkien, which is quite a spectacular and name. And you will forget that immediately. Instantly. The minute the minute that <laughs> any of you, like, the minute you turn this video or audio off, you're going to be like, what does J.R.R. stand for? I can't fucking remember. Uh, it was originally published in 1954, and it was intended to be under two quote-unquote book names. Uh, the First Journey... And the journey of the nine companions, otherwise known as the ring sets out and the ring goes south. Ooh, I didn't know that actually. Yeah, so he was originally intending for it to be like uh, two, not like two books exactly. I mean, it is still set out in two books. It is in the book, but I think the original idea was that would be how it was published. So yeah. you would buy. So in the same way that like dime paperbacks it, were like. Yeah, except they then just published it in three parts with six which volumes. It's really weird. Like it, um, and like they never published the volumes separately from each other, so I don't understand why they bothered. <laughs> like, it, like yeah, you go well, yeah, that would make sense if they were like yeah, the initial run was these six discrete pieces of like physical media, right. but no, they were like fucking whatever, just get call them whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, and then I wanted to say quickly before we get into it, we're doing this once a month. Uh, so next month's book we will be talking about. Daughter of Smoke and Bone by Lani Taylor. I can't work out how to pronounce her name. I think it's Lani or Lana or something like that. Uh, I'll put a link in the description to where you can buy that. So make sure you read that for next month. Uh, if you're a Patreon subscriber of ours as well, you get to vote on the books that we're going to cover in the future, which should be kind of fun and interesting. You can also suggest books and then respond to us in our post show, which we will eventually launch uh, further down the track. So I wanted to start with a quote from Tolkien that he wrote about the book itself. Um... Now, he wrote this in response to a bunch of criticism he got uh, because The Hobbit was very popular. Uh -huh. And The Hobbit was um, very simple and like a kind yeah. of... I mean, but The Hobbit was very digestible mm. as a book. It's very legible. It's pretty easygoing. Yeah. The lore is pretty light. It's like a, it's basically a series of like short stories that yeah. form together in like narrative. Like each chapter is like a little episode mm. and it, it would work really well as like a serialized thing rather than the movies that they... Decided yeah. to turn the Hobbit it would be like a great eight-part HBO series or something. Oh, it would be awesome. It's weird they didn't do that, HBO. I'm looking at you. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to read a pretty blocky quote from Tolkien, so bear with me here. Okay. This is him talking about, like, why he... Because one of the big controversies is that he wrote Lord of the Rings in the first place in the same universe. And this is his response to people that criticized him for doing so. And he says... The prime motive was the desire for a desire of a tale teller to try his hand at a really long story that would hold the attention of readers, amuse them, delight them, and at times maybe excite them or deeply move them. As a guide, I had only my own feelings for what is appealing or moving, and for many, the guide was inevitably often at fault. Some who have read the book, or at any rate reviewed it, have found it boring, absurd, and I have no cause <laughs> to complain since I have similar opinions of their works, or the kinds of writing that they evidently prefer. But even from the not- 
but even from the points of view of many who have enjoyed my story, there is much that fails to please me. It is perhaps not possible in a long tale to please everybody at all points, nor to displease everybody at the same points, for I find from the letters that I have received the, that the passages or chapters that are to some a blemish are all, by others, specially approved. The most critical reader of all, myself, now finds many defects, minor and major, but being fortunately under no obligation to either review the book or to write it again, he will pass over these in silence, except one that has been noted by many others. The book is too short. Tolkien's only <laughs> criticism of his of fellowship is that it wasn't long enough. The irony is insane oh, on that one. It's crazy, right? I love right? how he calls himself the most critical reader. Of his own work, yeah. yeah. Well, because he always hated his own stories, which I appreciate as like a... As a writer, like, that's something that you go, yeah, everything I do is bad. But yeah, he was like the original, like, edgelord, as far oh, as that boy. stuff is concerned. Were you, like, overly familiar with the way that that book was reviewed? Or was that a good insight for you into, like, <laughs> what people thought of it? That 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 is interesting, because I have literally never looked at a review of this book, actually. Well, it's interesting. Contemporary reviews are, like, really glowing after Jackson's Obviously, trilogy. Obviously, yeah. yeah. Um, and that probably, to a certain extent, that's probably coloured by how well-received the movies were. Big time. Um. Because, like, it, when, once you've seen the movie and you've sort of got an idea of how the series is shaped, kind of, if you get what I mean by that. Yeah, you mean, like, um, the narrative shape of yes. it. Yes. It makes the books much easier to read. Exactly, because you know what's coming up. Which makes it less... I don't want to say boring, but, like, structurally the books tend to meander a little bit more. Y you know what's you know what's incredible? Yeah. Um I meandered through this book for the first time um when I was I'm not exactly sure how old I was, but I was probably in primary school ish. Fuck. Yeah. Wow. Um, That's and, a hard one to read when you And a I was kid. like this is like a, a like well-known book. Let's let's read this. Did you um, enjoy it? Do you recall? I henceforth became insufferable at like movie viewings because oh, no, I would kid. furnish people with like extra details. The book is better. Were you that kid or were you no. just like the book has more data in it? No, I was just like, oh, here's an interesting tidbit of information. Oh, you were the trivia kid. That's somehow worse than the book is better than the movie kid. You were like, did you know that Gannett, blah, blah, and they're like, could you, it's just, we're trying to watch the film. I'm trying to watch Orlando Bloom and his beautiful visage. I hadn't even seen the movies at this point, but I did watch them after. Right. Um, no, that's interesting, though, because that most people don't have that experience these days. They see the films and they know about the books. Yeah. Um, and we'll touch on that, I think, at the end when we kind of try and tie it back into like a contemporary setting, but... The, I was always the kind of kid that would want to read the book before the material. I saw the movie. That's fair. I think in this case, watching the film before the book is the right way to go. Probably. Especially in a modern context. Probably. Yeah, but like, the yeah, the films are so different. Like, narratively, they have very similar plots, but the focus of them could not be more different. Oh, yeah. They, um, they move... They Well, they remove shit and they... Condense right. stuff down so much. In they're the like they're they're like, action epics. Honestly, like the 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 um the bit in Lorien in the book is like something like five fucking chapters. I'm probably exaggerating. No, there's but... some sections though where it's really long that they uh, just stuff that they cut entirely for brevity and stuff. And and like they they go through Lorien and there's the first night where they're just in the trees and then there's the second night where they go go into the heart of Lorien and then like they finally leave Lorien. Ordeal. Yeah. And then the fucking, like, um, Galadriel and Celeborn come along on their big white boat and they're like, let's have a final, f uh, like, feast and goes we'll on. give you presents. And you're like, ugh. Yeah, it goes on a lot. And, like, all of the, like, especially Gimli is like, they're all eating salad, these fucking animals. Um, <laughs> okay, so I wanted to talk quickly. So we'll, we'll try and save the movie talk for the end because that's all I want to talk about. But we have to actually look at the book itself. Yeah. Um, so before we get into like a quick summary of the plots, and then we can talk about some points that we found interesting and not, um, I wanted to touch on something as well uh, that was something that Tolkien said after the fact because this book has been analyzed to death because it's part of like fantasy canon, right? right. It's like one of the, it's like the fantasy book in inverted commas, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people have read it and tried to say that Tolkien was making these grand statements about like capitalism and communism and World War II and all of these things that happened when he was writing it. Yeah. Uh, and Tolkien kind of disagreed with this as a concept. Um, right. I have heard that. Yeah. Actually. We'll get to that after the summary but, because it's important based on the plot. But the other thing that he talked about is this idea of fairy stories 
um, he was talking about this this concept that like even though his allegories aren't intentional, that fairy stories and like fantasy narratives in general. I mean, whatever you're writing, that. like your experiences will feed into it. So. Exactly. And so on that note, exactly on that on that exact note, he said, far more powerful and poignant is the effect in a serious tale of fairy. In such stories, when the sudden turn comes, we get a piercing glimpse of joy and heart's desire that for a moment passes outside the frame, rends indeed the very web of story and lets a gleam come through. And on that note, he was talking specifically about this idea of like fantasy stories that have heart and have like real meaning make you like genuinely have an emotional reaction and you bring stuff to that. And that's why people think his work has allegory, mm-hmm. um, which I think he said <laughs> that was from his essay on fairy stories, which I yes. don't recommend reading. It's really long. Yeah. And kind of very meandering. I've definitely heard that quote before, though. Yeah, that one I quite like. It's it's very like Tolkien's very obsessed with like fairy tales. Um, so I yeah, mean, I probably would have gotten on with him because I love fairy tales too. Fucking nerds. Uh, what was your reading? <laughs> so, like, coming back to it now, what did you think of the book coming back to it as an adult? Um, it's a weird one. Um, I definitely found it difficult to read because it is a difficult read, no matter yep. really who you are. Yes. Um, instead of actually like reading it i borrowed um ben's audiobook mm-hmm. and just finished it that way it is easier to listen to i'll say that yeah yeah did you do you remember about where you stopped in the story oh was it in that weird bit where it's like just after they get just after they leave rivendell and everything slows down really quickly or was it before that i think it was mm, i definitely listened to i think it was before rivendell i think it was after where the top okay yeah yeah, that does sound about right. That's why they re- really flags. Um, so let's let's dip into a brief a brief summary, and then we'll talk a bit about different elements that we are interested in. Uh, so, <clears throat> the story of Lord of the Rings: Fellowship of the Ring properly properly starts with Bilbo's eleventy first birthday, wherein Bilbo leaves the Shire and gives all of his belongings to Frodo. Much to the Shire's irritation, Bilbo uses his a Bilbo uses a trick to vanish during a speech at his birthday party made more obvious by the film. This leaves Frodo and adopted Baggins with the entirety of Bilbo's considerable wealth. Included in this wealth and the personal effects of Bilbo is a magic ring that allowed Bilbo to disappear. The only people who knew of this ring were Frodo and Gandalf. Consequently, the wizard named Gandalf the Grey, a friend of Bilbo and mentor to Frodo, advises that Bilbo's ring may 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 in fact be a great artifact. Gandalf comes and goes for a number of years, I think 17, as he researches the possibility of this ring's great power, and after confirming it is in fact the One Ring of Legend, explains to Frodo that the ring that the ring belonged to an ancient evil, Sauron. Frodo agrees to take the ring to Bree, where he will reconvene with Gandalf, and though Frodo intends to retire and disappear on his quest without anyone knowing it, his closest friends conspire to come with him. The four hobbits set out from set out for Bree, quickly pursued by a faceless ring raids. In order to escape their pursuit, the hobbits travel through the old woods where they are. <laughs> I've written recused. The hobbits travel through the old woods where they are rescued from danger by Tom Bombadil, a bizarre being with strange omnipotent powers who reveals he is the oldest being on Middle Earth. Eventually, the hobbits arrive in Bree, meeting Strider after Frodo accidentally wears the ring during a rendition of a song. Strider takes the hobbits under his care. The group then learns Gandalf wishes to meet them at Rivendell, and in a letter from Gandalf given to them by the bartender, we learn that Strider is of important heritage. It's yet, if, it's yet unclear what this means, or his actual heritage, we just know his name is Aragorn. During the journey, the company is ambushed on Weathertop Hill. Frodo is stabbed by a weapon that plagues his soul and makes him progressively more ill. Closer to Rivendell, the company meets an elf lord named Glorfindel, who has rode to meet them. Glorfindel ho- Glorfindel's horse delivers Frodo safely to Rivendell. The master of Rivendell, Elrond, heals Frodo, then calls a council where the leaders of Free Folk discuss the ring's history and what is to be done with it. He will the ring can only be destroyed by being thrown into the cracks of Mount Doom, the very place from whence it was forged. Tensions at the meeting grow, and Frodo was chosen to take the ring to Mordor with Gandalf's support. Strider as- Strider's identity is properly explained, much to the elves' confusion, and a man from the south, Boromir's great irritation. The Fellowship of the Ring, consisting of four hobbits, Aragorn, Boromir, Boromir, Aragorn, Boromir, an elf lord, Legolas, a dwarf, Gimli, and Gandalf. The company journeys south, where the pass of Kadraha, Kar- Karadras. Karadras in the Misty Mountains is blocked by rock slides. Instead, instead of going over the mountains, they pass beneath the Misty Mountains via the Mines of Moria. 
This is something that's been touched on previously in the story, uh, and we know that there's been some, some mishaps there. During their path through the mountain's heart, Gandalf falls to his death while defending the company from a Balrog, a demon from another world. The company then continues to Lady Galadriel's realm of the Galadrim Elves. She then, after some difficulty and long set pieces, imparts gifts to the company. After Galadriel refuses Frodo's offer of the ring, the Fellowship travels to the river Anduin. That evening, they spot Gollum, the corrupted creature whom once owned the ring, roaming the banks. At the, fall, at the falls of Raros, which I could never learn to pronounce, R-A-U-R-O-S, mm. Roros, at the falls of Roros, the company has to, has to decide whether to journey east to Mordor or west to Minas Tirith at Boromir's behest. Ultimately succumbing to his human desire, Boromir gives in to his absolute and incorruptible desire for the One Ring, confronting Frodo. Frodo flees and realizes he cannot bear to see his friends or the Fellowship hurt by the power of the Ring, so then attempts to go east by himself. But Sam, his closest friend, goes with him, and together they set out for Mordor. End of book. So it really is like the start of a story, but like has yeah. this weird little bit where they form a party that then immediately gets broken. Yeah. And the and the end is really weird too because it just kind of leaves Boromir, Aragorn, and the rest of the hobbits and Gimli, sorry, yes, and Legolas. Um, it just kind of leaves them on like the east. Is it the east? Uh, they're on what? No, they're on the south side of the bank. Whatever on that yeah. side. Um, yeah, there's like no anything. They just there. get left there and like. Then the focus shifts to Frodo and Sam, and we never find out what happens to the rest of them. Mm. Which is interesting, because, like, chronologically, and not to touch on the second book, because I know it's about the first one, but chronologically, the second book opens immediately afterwards, where Boromir gets murdered. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, so, like, I think the basic philosophy of the story is that small people can do big things. Yeah. And that there's, like, a purity element to it. But you had a bunch of stuff that you written down that I wanted to touch on, and I'll try and fit in my research into what you had. Yeah, so why don't okay. you kick us off with a topic that you wanted to discuss? Um, one of the things that I re- I've, I found, like, sort of interesting, sort of... And, and I've been having a lot of trouble putting this into words. It's about sort of the archetypes um, of some of the characters. And I, and I guess in a lot of the ways this is kind of the book that kicked off a lot of fantasy archetypes. Mm-hmm. But so many characters in this book are very archetypal and they sort of fit into these boxes um, with each other. So, I mean, you have the hobbits, of course, and they have all these particular traits where they, um, they're they sort of short and they like to eat and they're kind of lazy and they, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they don't like to leave their little hobbit holes and go out into the world, but they do because of their, like, friendship with each other and they the fact that, you know, Frodo is determined to do what he must to make sure the world doesn't end um i yeah there's he feels a guilt not a guilt but like he feels an obligation to gandalf on behalf like for him especially at the start of that story his connection to the outer world is gandalf yeah and he trusts gandalf enough to be like i owe the world this obligation yeah and and it turns into a thing where like He's bearing the ring and he wants to continue that responsibility. And he feels responsible for the fact that it was passed on to him from Bilbo. And and I feel like Frodo and Sam are probably some of the most fleshed out characters in this book, actually. Sp- I mean, like, they, they have such um, drama. Yeah. Not in, not in, like, a bad way, but, like, they have, like, such interpersonal drama. Yeah. Through very, sm- like, you know, when they meet the elves in the woods... And there's that really surreal moment where Frodo's like, after the fact, he's like, was that everything you wanted? And Sam's like, man, I just don't know. Like, I, mm. it changed me, but I don't know what that means for yeah. me. You know? and, and later on, Sam still, like, Sam is such an intelligent character and I kind of mm. love him. Um, like, if you, if anyone was following my Twitter, like, I was, like, just while I was reading the start of this book, I was just furnishing my Twitter with Sam quotes because yeah, he's, he's kind of great, so wholesome. actually. Yeah. Um, so I definitely think Sam is probably my favorite character from this book. Mm-hmm. Not like, maybe not from the movie, but in the book, he's just sort of the best in terms of being fleshed out. He's more, I think in the films, at least, he's more like, uh, he's rendered in like a bit less detail because of time. Yeah. But especially in the book, like, and this is something that we'll talk about, I think, throughout, is that <laughs> the book has this like real sense of... Um, of, of, like, little moments that are really important. Like, yeah. it's the character interactions, like, you know, when they have breakfast and dinner and stuff like that. Like, Tolkien was tapping into something essential about, like, spending time with people over, a like, a great 
yeah. journey. And I think that's some of what this book does best is sort of the journey portions where they're going through and they're traveling, um, and, yeah. they're traveling and they're like um, encountering all these obstacles and they're working through it. And I think like the bits that I dislike the most mm-hmm. about this book are probably like the long sections where people are sitting around and talking and making oh, decisions. A, a and Jesus. Book. Yeah. 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 Um, from a broad perspective, that's probably yes. Um, my feeling about it. Um, Whereas anyway. like the back and forth tends to be a bit more like inter like when they're doing stuff in the back and forth thing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's yeah. more interesting. For um. Sure. Anyway, so that's the hobbits. Mm-hmm. Then you have the dwarves, which is basically just Gloin and Gimli. Yes. Um. Wait, I think is there is someone else at the council, and then you I get. Forget which- you get an offhand mention of the dwarves that went to Moria and never returned. Yeah, Balin and <sighs> Balin and someone Oin, else. Oin, I think. Maybe. Look, it could be. <laughs> Dwarf names all kind of sound the same to me after a while, where I'm like Balin and Gloin and Odin, and it's like they're all just Norse derivatives. Yeah. 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 Anyway, um, they're very like they have beards and they like. It was weird that the films made them like kind of Scottish and Irish. I thought that was an odd choice. <laughs> They Isn't have it... beards and they make shit and they're, yeah. they're dwarves. And... They're basically Thor. All they're of they're them. not very fleshed out in the books either. Like, there's this. Probably the thing it does best with the dwarves is the sort of like conflict between them and the elves is the yes. most fleshed out. Actually, um, yeah, that, yeah. But like, sure. Legolas and Gimli become friends in like a sentence. <sighs> yeah, there, there's a. I think there's a reason for that from like a storytelling perspective in that. What they needed was, like, another team. Like, what he was looking for was a team that could then support Aragorn as part of, like, the mythos. Yeah. Like, so... something. But, that- like, emotionally, like, they kind of get forced together in the films and it has the same effect where, like, they're bickering all the time but they become yeah. friends. It... I don't think it works as well in the film, to be honest. All right. I don't know. Well, because, like, at least in the film, for me, it always felt a bit... Maybe it's just Orlando Bloom's magnetism, but it felt a bit easy. Like, where you're like, ah, he's just, like, a bit too... Cha-. Like, there's nothing ostensibly wrong with Legolas in the film, whereas in the book, he's more dynamic. Like, he's a bit more complex, especially the elves in general. Um, but I can read a quote that I have from the book about that kind of idea, um, and it's to do with, like, the essentialism of the elves and the dwarves as, like, two spectrum, two ends of the spectrum on, like, nature mm-hmm. and earth and, like, being good. Because one thing that Western canon does a lot is, like, um, equivocate like nature with like being good so like good characters come from like earthy places hobbits come from holes in the ground yeah sauron comes from a volcano like they're very like (laughs) he doesn't really come from a volcano no but it's like different ends of the spectrum like thematically you know uh so the quote goes like this it's from gladriel um speaking to sam when she's giving him a gift Mm -hmm. and i think it speaks like the kind of essentialist themes of like earth as being good and nature as being good uh and she says to sam For you, little gardener and lover of trees, I have only a small gift. Here is set G for Galadriel, but it may stand for garden in your tongue. In this box, there is earth from my orchard, and such blessing as Galadriel has still to bestow it, to still bestow is upon it. I will not keep you on your road nor defend you against any peril, but if you keep it and see your home again at last, then perhaps it may reward you. Though you should find all barren and laid waste, there will be few gardens in Middle Earth that will bloom like your garden, and if you sprinkle this earth there. Then you may remember Galadriel and catch a glimpse far off of Lorien that you have only seen in our winter. For our spring and our summer are gone by, and they will never be seen on earth again, save in memory. And it's just so nice. I just love that, like, Sam is like this. He's the dude who it's like, here's a box of soil, and he's so happy. He's like, hell yeah, I love gardening. It's my thing. Sam is great. He's just so, I don't know. like He's so wholesome. He's so wholesome, and, like, you know, if, if you want hobbits to be this kind of, And, like, obviously Tolkien's looking for hobbits to be the heroes of the story because they're the least likely heroes. Yeah. Sam likes strawberries and gardening. And, <laughs> like, he's Frodo's gardener, and right? he loves elves, too. He's big, big fan of elves, but he's, like, more in love with the idea of elves than Yeah, elves and then themselves. when he meets them, he's like, oh, they're kind, of, they're kind of weird and inscrutable, but, like, they're still cool. They seem rad, though. Like, that's his, like, <laughs> takeaway. Um, but, yeah, there's a, there's a um, theme on that that Tolkien's drawing on from, like, Shakespeare and, like, even, like, Greek theatre. Um... <laughs> I can like go way into this, which I will do quickly. Um, so this is like this was like something that I studied a lot in high school. Uh, so Euripides, who was like Euripides, was like a big Greek uh, Greek playwright and poet. He did like lots of tragedies, um, and he was obsessed with this idea of like 
everyday people being tied to the earth and the gods being tied to like the heavens mm -hmm. so in grecian theater it's like odin and zeus and all of these characters are like up in the clouds mm -hmm. and then you know the athenians are on the ground um and he basically suggested throughout his work that farming and gathering food and gardening and stuff like that um is like a really wholesome thing to do and it's like connects you with other people right whereas like mythical greek heroes only think about themselves um and you can see that kind of reflected in tolkien's work where like legolas even gimli to an extent like especially boromir like these characters who are more like the heroes that we know mm. from like the comic books like your batmans and your supermans and stuff like that they're kind of the equivalent they kind of like whilst they care about the world they're very much obsessed with like i am son i'm such and such son of someone such and such and i'm the heir to blanky yeah. blank blank oh i had a i had a point about that actually yeah um, um do, like what do you think about that when you read it as a grown-up because as a kid you're like these dudes are all badass. They got these crazy cool heritages and he's got a broken sword. Whereas as an adult, you're like, these dudes are posturing so hard. Yeah, I mean, all that stuff about noble lineage is <sighs> like, oh, like you read it and you're like, God damn, none of these people is like nobody from nobody town. They're all just like, I am son <sighs> of blah and I'm from this, like, so like Boromir's up. got such a fucking like mm. hard on for the fact that he's a man oh, yeah. of Gondor. He's so obsessed with it. <laughs> It, but then that speaks to, like, this element of... Um, Tolkien seems to really condemn pride as an emotion. Yeah. Anyone who's prideful gets killed pretty quick. Yeah, and, and like, that's probably the difference with, like, Aragorn is that he's, um, he's like, of noble lineage. He's, like, but the... He, right. Like, he's son, the of a, most noble son of a son of a son of a son of a, like, king. But he rejects that, yeah. And, but he, he decides to be a ranger, and he doesn't really want to be king. And yes. he has to accept that um that he need he, that he's needed as like yes. the king it's the contrast between <clears throat> what's valor and pride and so valor is doing the right thing because you know you must and pride is doing it because you want the kind of glory yeah um we'll come back because i want to touch on that in a second because i have some notes about that as well but i also wanted to point out just a few like things that tolkien does that are just like nature equals good because i think like it's important to acknowledge Fair. in this text um gandalf's staff is made of like an ancient magic tree uh, Galadriel's garden is purely good, but in the image of a god, it's not real because it's of fairy, and that gets touched on by the people that are in it. Um, Sam is a gardener, and while Frodo might be the ring bearer, Sam is the most pure expression of the essentialist view of an innocent small person who cares about little things, and that's why Sam ultimately is able to save Middle Earth, not Frodo. Um, just a few examples. So, this is what I want to talk because I'm really interested to hear what you think of this. Mm -hmm. So, this idea of like. Frodo and Aragorn as being like opposites almost. Um, let me see if I can find it. Where are you, Mr. Notes? Um, because they're kind of they act as like foiled almost to each other. Which are you I'm, talking about Boromir? Because you said Frodo, I meant Frodo also. Um, okay, Frodo, Boromir, and Aragorn are all foils of each other. Okay, here we go. So, this is like the basic philosophy of the story, but yeah, so what I had is that Strider, uh, Strider, because in the first book I always think of him as Strider, yeah. he's not Aragorn until the second one for me. That's just a personal they thing. They kind of make a switch halfway through. It's when you get to Rivendell that people start calling him Aragorn that yeah. they then, but well, I... I think I think the hobbits still call him Strider at that point. Yes, because the in Gandalf's letter, when they get to the Prancing Pony, it says, like, ask him what his name is, and he is immediately like, Aragorn, son of blanky, like, Arathorn, whatever the, the lineage <laughs> thing yes. is. You know, the, you know the quote? Yes, yes. Where he's like, Aragorn, son of... And it's very impressive, and the hobbits are like, who the fuck is that? And he's like, it doesn't matter, just, I'm very important, trust me. And they go, <laughs> if Gandalf said so... Um, yeah, so Strider acts as sort of a foil for Frodo, less than Boromir, which we'll touch on. Uh, so Frodo comes from a small place, has never really wanted anything other than to live happily, mm -hmm. and to occasionally go on an adventure. He yearns for a large world, but does not seek one out. Conversely, Strider is the most important person in the world, but forsakes this destiny and identity in order to serve in much smaller ways that he feels are more important, ultimately saving little people in little ways, but generally achieving nothing. So Strider is kind of like the guy who goes, I don't want to be king. I want to like help these farmers defend yeah. against these goblins or whatever. Um, and in the same way, Boromir is like an embodiment of Aragorn's insecurity. Right. So Boromir is rash. He's emotional. And he's he's self-important. He's so self-important. He's prideful and dangerous. Yeah. Um, uh, and Aragorn is the opposite, but like at the yeah. detriment of leading. Like Boromir Bor doesn't listen to anybody. No. 
even like fucking Elrond, who's like the dude. You know? Like everybody should listen to Elrond because according to the book, he's perfect. He's yeah. Well, the book does like they're like Elrond's the guy. Don't worry about it, guys. He's the guy. Don't worry about it. He's very handsome and very sexy. But he's perfect. Oh everywhere. God! When it comes to a lot of the elf characters, I find that does some Tolkien of them fuck are, them all. Some of them are a little bit cookie cutter, where it's like they're perfect in every way. Yeah. Do you think that that like what what did you make of that? Because I have I don't really have a thought about that in any way. But like, was that something that you were conscious of throughout the book? Like, they never seem to put a foot wrong in the eyes of pretty much anybody. Um, right. It's weird. Even, like, Legolas, who is, like, the most flawed of the elves, kind of, even his pride is, like, excused because he's really good at combat and is very perceptive. Yeah. You know? Um, he, literally, he literally just, like, walks across the snow and he's, like... To be fair, the films completely ruin that by then making him, like, uh, like a god somehow, where he's, like, an action hero. Whereas the book is, like, no, he's just very good at balancing his weight that's like his one super skill he's like <laughs> really good at balancing and the films were like what if he's a superhero who can slide on a shield down a thing and you're like, <laughs> what happened there but no, yeah no totally in, in tolkien's world just elves have no mass they can just walk on snow yeah well because he didn't think they were like from like he because for him elves are fairies and i have a quote on that later as well but for him like elves are equivalent to like fairies so they're like magic but he wanted to make them relatable so he made them like less magic it's weird i don't know what the fuck but they don't thinking. like the term magic though because it's no. like they're magic but also they're not magic because they don't like to call it magic no they're like of the uh they're like of the essential elements of creation yeah, like it's the, weird yeah i don't know what, what he was doing there um the other comment that i had before we ne move on to your next point was uh on the idea of uh boromir and aragorn um the difference between the two is that uh boromir is like the end goal of what happens if you are born with noble lineage but you don't give it up in pursuit of, like, doing good. And Aragorn is, like, the opposite. At the, if... The, like, if you don't give it up or if you're not, like, like humble about it, I suppose. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because, like, he does have his brother who is kind of, like, the good even, one. Yeah, even Faramir is, like, a bit fucked up. Um, a little bit, but he I has meant, a redemption. I meant give up in the sense that, like, give it up for, like, give up the idea of the noble heritage to do good. So, like, whether that's being, like, I might be king, but I have to do the right thing. Versus, like, what Boromir does, where he's like, I'm so important, I, I, I'm the best, yeah. and my, my my kingdom's the best, and everyone should and, bow and to I us. And I think it's sort of inferred that he gets that from his dad, who is a total scumbag. What a piece of shit, though. We <laughs> oh, don't meet God. him in this, we get enough allusions to it that I'm like, even in the book, I'm like, wow, this guy's a real turd. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. What did you make of his dream? The the fact that um, uh, Boromir and uh, uh, Faramir have this shared dream um that this prophetic dream where they learn they should seek the broken sword and a seal dealer's bane at rivendell uh, and the prophecy is false because um he looks at it as being literal so uh boromir is like i had this crazy prophetic dream where i had to go to rivendell and I had to i had to get the seal dealer's bane and the broken sword um and it's here in rivendell somewhere but turns out that strider's got the broken sword and isildur's bane is the ring yeah so the the prophecy is wrong but well, the, the prophecy is not so much wrong as it's super vague and it doesn't tell them why they need to seek it yes just that they need to my point about it being wrong is what i just want to get your your perspective on because i've read this is very much being like Tolkien leaning on this idea of like ambiguity and like pragmatism um so, like, yeah, the sword has been with Strider the whole time, so it's actually not been in Rivendell. So is it just coincidence that they get so there at the same time? what was the wording on the, on the prophecy? Uh, the pro I don't have the exact quote, but it's they should seek the broken sword and Isildur's bane at Rivendell. So the broken sword being the, yeah. um, the sword of the king and Isildur's bane being the ring. But they don't know what that means. Uh, what have I got? So neither object is actually at Rivendell, but rather is being carried by Frodo and Aragorn. The inversion here is that Boromir is really looking for the people, not the objects, obviously. Yeah. Um, this suggests that, much like prophecies and visions in the later books, that any kind of, like, magical vision or prophecy is not to be trusted, and they're rarely literal. This well, kind of... I think Galadriel says something similar when they look into the mirror, actually. Very much so. It's a theme that he kind of is really interested in, I think. Yeah. But isn't her thing about, like, she sees, like, the fall of everything if he gives the ring to anyone else... Like, do you remember that? Because I I know what it is in the movie, but I can't remember in the book because it's very long. Yeah. Um. In the book, Frodo looks and he sees bad things. It's definitely bad things. He's, he, but in in the end, he he sees the eye and 
Yes, um, he's, he sees Sauron eventually, but and I think... he leans forward into the pool. And yes. That happens in the movie as well, actually. It does, actually, yeah. But I, th- I think what it's trying to, like, suggest is that Boromir's downfall and Saruman's eventual downfall are because they both rely on this, like, greater mystical, yeah. like, prophecy. Like, they're, But at, at the same time, I think it's probably something to do with, like, the... The fact that he kind of misread the prophecy in terms of the fact that the prophecy is really, really, really vague. Mm-hmm. And because Boromir is so prideful, he takes that as he needs to take the ring and the sword um, rather than the real interpretation, which he needs to band together with the people that own the ring and the sword. Mm-hmm. Yes. It, oh, okay. No, that's actually, yeah, that's a really interesting reading. I like that a lot. Yeah, the idea that like he's read it as I need to get them. But the prophecy was like, no, 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 seek them out and aid these people. Right. Oh, that's really cool. Fuck, that's actually really cool. What an awesome idea. Yeah, and he's he's gone like the pride. He's because he thinks he's the the center of the universe. Mm. Wow, what a piece of shit. Boromir, <laughs> Boromir, what a what a what a dunk Boromir is. Um, there was a point I was gonna make uh, about. I've completely lost the thread because I'm so impressed. That's such an interesting <laughs> idea. Yeah, well, that's crazy. But yeah, like even Saruman's downfall, like the reason that he struggles is that um, his trust in, uh, like, because prophecy is vague. Um, there's a wisdom in Gandalf, especially as someone that purports this a lot, where there's a wisdom in not deciding something too early. Yeah. So there's a, dis- no, you go, because I've got a quote that I can read. But, but yeah, and, and I think the thing is that Saruman sort of loses faith in gandalf's kind of hope where gandalf he like he knows that there's a hugely slim chance that this um quest is going anywhere Mm -hmm. like there's so many obstacles to overcome Mm -hmm. they're probably just gonna die along the way yeah but he has faith and hope that the company will succeed and that's something that saruman loses when he goes I don't think we can win this. We should just band together with the Dark Lord instead. But th- but he gets there through using the he his his assumption is like if I use the t- so he does literally this the same thing Boromir wanted to do. He's like I'll use the tools of the Dark Forces to get an upper hand, and that's how yeah. he gets sucked in. Although know? um that's not really gone into in the first book actually. No, that's true. That is in the second book. But like as far as like themes go, I'm just interested in that. Um so on the on the topic of like Gandalf and Mercy, um. And this idea of, like, prophecy especially. In discussion with Gandalf, Frodo suggests that Gollum is as bad as an orc and deserves to die. Do you remember this conversation? Yes, yeah. So Gandalf responds with, Deserve it, I dare say he does. Many that deserve life deserve death. And some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? Then do not be too eager to deal out death in judgment. For even the very wise cannot see all ends. This, for me at least, and I'm curious to see what you think, this for me sets up the idea that, like, the mercy of hobbits is essential in the destruction of evil. Like that, not, that not only is valor and accept things once like and and coming to terms with one's past crucial, but ultimately humility is what defeats evil. And like recognizing you need other people. You know, there's something interesting in that this theme is actually paralleled in, and I'm I'm just going to jump series for a second no, here. A, yeah, go for it. Um, if you look at Harry Potter yep. and what happens with Wormtail, yep. where Harry spares him. And then later, Wormtail um, basically ends up um, What's his re- aiding them to his own downfall. What's his redemption? I can't recall in Harry Potter. What, is, what does Wormtail do? Can you remember? Um, I, they're in the cell and like he oh, he lets them out and yeah. gets strangled by his own hand. Sure. Yeah. And c- yeah, when they're all trapped in there and it's Dobby and whatnot. And then yeah. Dobby gets knifed. Yeah. Yeah. What a sad, sad time. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Good parallel. So you think that like the the mercy of it's exactly the same thing yeah. yeah it's the exact same theme actually yeah it's it's like letting it's like maybe that mercy and i think harry says something similar in that he should have killed wormtail and dumbledore goes no maybe you shouldn't have it's also a coincidence that gandalf and dumbledore look exactly the same and i'm not <laughs> and wormtail in the book is kind of described a bit like golem it's fine don't worry about it um J.K. Rowling's a very original author, and the books are really good. I'm just concerned that maybe we're being a bit derivative as far as, like, fantasy is concerned. The fact that we'll take them as canon is concerning. I like Harry Potter, though. Um, it is a good series. It's perfectly fine. Uh, okay, so <laughs> I do like Harry Potter. I just think people are very forgiving of that series for its themes and the way that it's written, and I think that's fine because a lot of people like it, but 
at some point we'll touch on those books because I have a lot to say about them and it's not uh -huh. great. I have very unpopular opinions about those <laughs> books. Um, oh, that'll so, be exciting. Oh, yeah. I oh. get so many emails. Watch uh, people, like, vote that to be the next well, one. I've already done, like, a video I say about Harry Potter that people were like, oh, this is a really good point. And then everyone else went, why don't you like Harry Potter? I was like... It's not that you don't like it. It's, it's that you have that, opinions. It's just that I read it properly. Can we all. not have opinions about a thing and like it at the same time? No, it's the internet. You can't. You either hate it or you love it, Laura. Those are the two options, okay? <laughs> it's either infallible or... Or it's, or it's the worst thing ever made. And yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, intimating Nazis uh -huh. coming back. Uh, so, yeah, I, I wanted to talk about the, this idea that, like, uh, Boromir is, like, the embodiment of pride. This is in direct <laughs> relation to this this thing of Gandalf and Mercy. So, in, in the place of Frodo, uh, if he was faced with, like, killing Gollum, he would immediately just murk the, murk the dude. Right. Um, and as a result, because of this thematic overture of the story uh boromir will go on to fall he doesn't fall in this book but he will go on to fall because he can't accept frodo's decision to not give in to his own pride and use the ring as a weapon so like ultimately boromir's punishment for being selfish and prideful uh and not observing valor is that he is killed yeah um in the line of duty and for him, he would view that as like a valorous yeah. death. But and he has his biggest downfall moment at the end of this book, where he tries to take the ring yes. from Frodo, and he he goes to such a low place. Um, yeah, it gets really dark. And that I think it's really dark. He even has book. to like realize he even realizes afterwards what he's done. Yeah. But that can't be taken back. The fact that he did that and that the fellowship is now broken. In in the next book, which I don't want to touch on too much, but like because it's in the first film, uh, then he dies. Yeah. And. Aragorn valorizes Boromir's actions by putting him in the um the boat the boat yeah. and then setting it aflame. Um, do you think that he deserves to be redeemed in that way by Aragorn, or is that speaking more to Aragorn's character than Boromir's? Because I I was wondering about this reading it because I know that like especially the like the film is very like actiony where it's like you right. did a bad thing oh orcs are here but the book takes its yeah. time with like letting you be like yeah Boromir feels awful for what he's done yeah. I yeah, I think from a certain perspective, um it's kind of saying that, you know, everybody can be redeemed. Um in terms of the like Boromir gets redeemed, but then he dies. Um yeah. and like he he realizes the error of his ways and then he goes on to um help the hobbits. Um and he realizes that they're important. Um not that I've read the second book in a while, but this no. is kind of... No, but yeah, I know what you mean. It's, it's that kind of... The way that Boromir dies kind of cues Aragorn... Well, like, I guess Aragorn already knew, but, like, cues the rest of the Fellowship into this... Into the fact that, like, even though they don't have the ring, the other hobbits are part of the Fellowship. Because I think, like... Because when Boromir says they've got the other hobbits... Yeah. And there is... In the film, there's a weird intimation, especially the second film, there's a, this weird, like, intimation that... Um, they don't know which hobbits the orcs have. Oh yeah, that's yeah. a weird plot point. Whereas, like, that in the, is weird. In the book, it's pretty. Aragorn's like, yeah, I fucking know that who they have. Like, he's yeah. aware of it. Yeah. So it's even like the theme is even stronger. He's like, it doesn't matter who it is. We have to save them. Right. And that's such a powerful like. I don't know. For me, like coming off the end of this book, where the book ends with like. It's kind of like an Empire Strikes Back ending where it's like, it's pretty <laughs> fucking dark. Yeah. Like, Frodo and Sam are like, it's just us, and Frodo was going to leave without him. Yeah. You know? Sam um, nearly fucking drowns. Yeah, some quick some quick dot points um, on that note before we get into your next topic. Um, this is just on the idea of, like, Tolkien's obsession with, like, pragmatism and, like, redeeming characters that ne don't necessarily deserve it. Um, Farmer Maggot, a man who the Hobbits previously disliked due to his farm and angry dogs, turns out to be a really fair host and a generally good dude. Uh, Sam has really lofty expectations for meeting elves, but ultimately he leaves the experience with Gilfandor, Gil no, Gildor, realizing he was in love with the idea of meeting elves, not the act of knowing elves. And now he's not sure what he actually wants, just that he wants to be around his friends. When the gang is captured by the Barrow White, the danger isn't for naught as they gain magic weapons. One of the Hobbits... I think it's Merry or Pippin, I can't remember. One of the hobbits even comments that maybe flying into danger is never wise, but that not all ills end badly. And that's something the book does a lot, where it's like, we fucked up and we nearly died, but we met Tom Bombadil, and that's dope. Like, it's yeah. a lot of the book where it's like, we, f we goofed up, but it worked out pretty nicely. Yeah. You know? And now we're naked on the grass. Yeah, And it's a classic <laughs> Wednesday. Um, yeah, totally. Uh, what if, what's, uh, what's the next thing you wanted to talk about? 
So this book, it's really interesting because it sort of comes from a different era from mm-hmm. where we are now. Very and as as a writer, mm-hmm. there's a lot of things that are touted as like conventions or like rules that are absolutely ignored in this book. So you have things yeah. like the show don't tell rule where they'll just say stuff and they'll just describe it. Mm-hmm. And you know, for the most part it's kind of interesting because um I, th- there was one um I forget which elf th- I think this was this was one of the elves, but um the way that he was described was um on his brow sat wisdom, on his hand sat strength. And that's like, yeah, he's describing him, but he's doing it in such a way that you sort of get the idea of it rather than sort of straight up saying he was strong and he was wise. It sort of has like a better ring to it. Yeah, there's this, I know, yeah, even from like a prose perspective, there's something that Tolkien did that it's not as on the nose as being like, this guy was really strong. But it's pretty close. Yeah. But it's not quite there. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And yeah, did, did you enjoy that going back to it as a grown up or not? Because I struggle with it. Yeah. Because I love Neil Gaiman and Patrick Rothfuss, and like that's how I write in a very similar yeah. style. Yeah. So like I don't do big description. I do like intimation and like suggestion and like a character has this weapon on the hip and yeah. you're and they, they wear these clothes and you're able to be like oh they might be this this like you can kind of yeah. go from there. Whereas I feel like yeah for sure it I don't know I. It bothered. It didn't bother me, but I was so conscious of it. The whole yeah, time. it's so weird. Where like, um, you know, they'll they'll like describe a character as being noble and fair of face, and you're like, okay. Yeah, and you're like, what does that mean though? <laughs> like, what, like, what are they gonna? And then, like, even Gimli, when you first meet him, there's like this half a par. It's it's like three pages or something of like the description around Gimli and like what he's doing and what he's wearing and his and like it's not until later that you realize all of it's like foreshadowing the tools that he owns and the way he's going to act and stuff. Mm. Like, at the time, you're like, I just don't care. <laughs> I'm trying to meet the other people in the council. Yeah. Oh, God, that council uh. meeting fucking drags on. And, like, Elrond goes on for, like, a page and a half about the history of the ring, and you're like, why? So I read... Th- I was reading the book up to that point. I swapped to my audiobook for the... Uh, like, until we got to Moria, and then I switched back to the physical book. Right. Because it is so slow. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> oh. There's characters that you meet once where it's like, okay, this this elf is named this, and here is their entire family history. And you're like, I don't need to know that. I'm fine. I'm good. But like, yeah, for sure. Mm. On that, actually, something that I forgot to note down: the fact that they leave the hobbits, except for Frodo be- and Bilbo, because they have been ring bearers, and that somehow makes them important. They leave yes. them entirely out of the council meeting, um, and then Sam just kind of trots in along with Frodo yeah. and nobody notices him until he speaks. Well, isn't that isn't that to Gandalf's point though? That like True. the reason that the hobbits so like I I don't know. This is like a big theme of the book, but like this idea that <sighs> hobbits themselves um represent something like like elves are like the the grand yeah. like they're like the ethereal. The, but like the, hobbits are so easily overlooked. Yeah, like wizards are like this kind of conduit for like ancient wisdom. Mm-hmm. Um, el you know elves these ethereal things. Dwarves are like the people that shape the world, and orcs are like evil, and urukai are like the manifestation of Sauron's will. Yeah, and hobbits are just like. They like beer. Literally, Elrond's like, oh, I'm going to, like, pick some elves to go along with you. And Merry and Pippin are like, but we want to come. Yeah, right. And you're like, why? Yeah, it's crazy <laughs> to me. Like, it, I don't know, there's something so um, essentialist in his idea, in, like, Tolkien's idea of, like, what good people are. Like, he's mm. like, no, it's not the sword that you carry or, like, the heritage you have. It's just, like, like I, he's almost deconstructing the mythology of, like, not superheroes, but, like, myths, like, mytholo- uh uh, mythological characters in general mm. like uh he's not interested in thor or um batman the like these archetypes who who were like and obviously he doesn't he didn't know they existed he was dead before after they came out but like you know what i mean like those kind of <laughs> right. those those kind of uh platonic ideals of myth in our common pop culture kind yeah. of zeitgeist he just like was interested in the everyday goings on of these people that Liked beer mm. and lived under hills and yeah, you some know. of his like best little moments are so mundane, but like, like it's very cute. Like I yeah. don't know, he, it's very um, p- is pure the right word? 
I don't know. It's something very. Uh, it's like it's anytime there's like a Hobbit moment when I'm reading the book, I can hear oh, in my I head. I love the, the Hobbit moments. The Shire music swelling in my head. I bloody love it's them. Like, That's no, why no, I was like no, doing no, Sam quotes no, on my no. on my Twitter. Like yeah. Sam fucking throws an apple at oh, an evil so human. Good. It's so good. There are so many moments in this book where Sam does something and you're like... And he goes, waste of a good apple. You're like, what are you doing? <laughs> he's the best. Leave it alone. Even on Weathertop, he completely freaks out. But he's like, no, I got this. And he like jumps in front of Frodo and you're like, no, Sam. <laughs> stop. And then Frodo pops on the ring and he's out of there. But yeah, it's moments like that where it's just like, these characters are so fun to spend time. Like, yeah, Aragorn is cool. Like, he's like... You know, in the pub when they so meet him. He's so underdeveloped in this book. Yeah, it's because they wanted him to be, like, the standoffish, like, man with no name trope where it's yeah. like... And then in the next book, you learn that he's, like, who he is in relation to uh, Gimli and, and Legolas. Like, like you, you don't learn anything about the whole Arwen thing. That was why they it added that to the It gets alluded to yeah. in... In the Galadriel thing, I think that's the the even star that he gets. But from even Galadriel. even that romance is really slim in the books in general. Yeah. It's barely there. Like it's kind of intimate. And that's kind of like his big arc in the films. Which makes sense. it makes sense, but I don't like it. That his only reason to help people, like, and this is like obviously like a reductionist reading, but like his only reason to be good is. Because he wants, because of, because of Arwen. Like, I don't know. There's something to that which I find yeah, very. Yeah, I, I mean, I never really read that into the movies. Like, it's more the, the message that it, that it could. Can I... Yeah, I, I feel like the the movies sort of like come across as like Aragorn is like this really good guy that doesn't want to be the king, but like Arwen does sort of. Yeah, she does kind of convince him that he really needs to. Which take up his kingly thing in like, the books he realizes it because he realizes he wants to help people in a bigger way yeah but yeah. like she gets the sort like she gives up her elven her uh, whatever immortality and, him, to give him and then like that's when um elrond elrond gets the sword reforged and goes after him and tells him to take up his Right, oh, that sword. is how it happens in the in the films, yeah. So, but like in in the books, like oh, Aragorn's weird. just kind of carrying around the sword. Yeah, what a weird sequence of events. It, I think it works better in the film as as far as that theme is concerned, of like valor and like taking up your responsibility. But throwing Owen in the mix makes it feel vaguely sexist in some ways, or has undertones of like. There are always problems, yeah. like with Tolkien, because there's so few female characters, and the way that it can be read is just. Mm -hmm. It's weird because like. You have Galadriel too, and she's like a female character, and she's like an elf, and she's so good, and and she doesn't really have any like f feminine characteristics at all. Not really. She's just a character. Like she's and not then, even like sexified in the way that other fantasy tends to do. Like, nothing about her character is really essential to her being a woman. No, well, which is interesting, except for the fact that she's with Celeborn. <laughs> It suggests to me that Tolkien knows how to write female characters and chose not, or just like didn't feel the need to. Which like it was like. 47 when he wrote this so i get that yeah i mean like, she she definitely falls into the category of characters that you could gender swap and nothing would change i put her in the tom bombadil tom bombadil box of characters where it could be anyone playing that role and it would probably work because yeah. the whole point of the character is it could be anyone yeah oh actually interesting i completely because i tend to forget about tom bombadil for oh, yeah. good reason um but, like, I find the stuff with him and, like, Goldberry kind of weird. Fucking crazy, dude. I have a quote here from uh, J.G. Keeley, which says, Though Tom Bombadil remains as a strangely incoherent reminder of the moral and social complexity of the fantasy tradition. This is so wanky, this quote. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's written by, like, I, he's like a college professor, but it, re it reads like it's written by someone who, um, you know that tone of someone who's just discovered that God isn't real? Hmm. And they're like, guys, you know God isn't real. They're like, yeah, I worked that out when I was 10. But they have that tone of like, uh, religious people are idiots. It reads a bit like that. Yeah. Um, Though Tom Bombadil remains a strangely, oh, it's so hard to, a strangely incoherent reminder of the moral and social complexity of the fantasy tradition upon which Tolkien draws, he did his best to scrub the rest clean, spending years of his life trying to fit Catholic philosophy more wholly into his pagan adventure realms. Um... The point that this guy is trying to make is that Tom Bombadil is like this omnipotent kind of... Um, he is the master. He knows everything. About his little corner of the woods, apparently. But just that. But he's also the oldest being on Middle-earth. Yeah. And it's Nobody like, quite knows what he is. And like, no one's ever heard of him. 
Yes. Uh, so Tom Bombadil and like yeah, that that idea yeah. of him being this omnipotent kind. Mm, of... I find that like the relationship with like Goldberry so weird. Every time I read it, I'm like he's all, he's constantly like Goldberry is waiting, and I found her in the stream. Wait. So like, and... but who the fuck is she? She's just she's no one, she's right? She's just this like weird like nymph that he found in the woods one day. And she's just a fairy. Took home right? and like made into his wife like it's so weird what's his deal <laughs> it's so and it's like weirdly like um reinforcing like this idea that the woman sort of stays at home while the man goes out and does shit and she's just kind of at home doing stuff <sighs> but then she's like... also a forest nymph so i'm like is that but then she goes out on her washing day but that's her washing day but like well yeah is she just the like <laughs> platonic like 1940s ideal of a housewife maybe because that's a possibility he's constantly like goldberry is waiting at home so for weird. me and you're it's like... so weird like that's such a left of field thing because you go from shortcut to mushrooms to them getting lost in the forest and then it's like here's the weirdest couple in the world <laughs> she's a forest nymph that does laundry and he's the oldest thing on middle earth and you're like this is like 20 chapters into this book <laughs> We just met elves and they were weird. Now you're introducing this character. Yeah, so I was like reading it. And I'm like, this is so weird. And I don't know what to feel about it. Because like, <sighs> I'm a feminist and this feels wrong. It feels wrong. But then you go, but he's not a man. There's nothing like explicitly But she's wrong also not a woman. It, but it feels wrong. It feels wrong. It does. It's so <laughs> weird. It's it, It'd be like uh, discovering that your favorite like comic book character like was secretly into... Like, something real creepy and weird. Like, they were like, I like it when people crash cars. And you were like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, it's not, like, offensive. You're like, I don't, this doesn't gel with anything that I know. It's so strange. Um, but yeah, I wanted to kind of... Do, do you have anything else you want to talk about before we kind of wrap in all of this in a bow? Uh, let's see, let's see. Um, quickly, um, like, this is sort of tying into my stuff about, like, modern writing conventions. The Gandalf death thing mm -hmm. is so unemotional oh my god yeah like so he dies and there there's like barely like two sentences of like their like feelings it's about very it. quick and then like they go to lorian and suddenly th it goes back to their talking about their grief and you're like what grief contrast to the film where it's so well done right where it's like every like either they change all the, the way the sound works and everything is like echoey and like the Hobbit, you focus on the Hobbit's grief, especially yeah. Frodo's, um, and you're like, whoa, that effect. But then, yeah, they get to, like, Lauren, and they're like, we're really sad. You're like, you guys sure? Because we've just spent half an hour, you not being Probably part sad. of why, like, the Lorien section feels so weak to me. Interesting. Yeah, just because it doesn't tie together properly. Like, I was reading it, and I was like, well, or listening to it, and I was just like, I feel nothing. Like, if this were, like, properly, I should feel something. Like, I usually feel something when a character dies, if it's a character that's meant to be sympathetic, but I like felt Gandalf. nothing. I wonder if that was his intent. Not to, like, overread into what Tolkien does, because no one had done the kind of writing he did before, but, like, I wonder if that was what he was trying to do, where it's, like, Gandalf falls and everyone is really numb for a while. Everyone just kind of, like, like, it goes out of, like, the reader's mind, because nobody talks about it for, like chapters and chapters and then they go to Lorien and they have a chance to reflect and suddenly it's like we're all in such grief. Do you think that would have worked better if like that had been like a slow uh, slow progress so like instead of what happens it was just they like, literally get there and they're like we're so sad <laughs> instead of that like if it was like kind of as the chapters went on they slowly let themselves grieve as they relax from the threat like cause in the, yeah, in the maybe. cause like in the um, in the film at least uh, Gandalf dies, and then they... they They're still in a, danger, so they have to run away. Yeah, they, they flee, and then they spend a lot of time... Like, the Hobbits and Boromir connect as, like, a reprieve for them. Yeah. It's grief, and that's why they connect. And it makes his death even more impactful. Whereas in this, it's like... Yeah, they just forget that they're upset, and then they suddenly remember they're upset, and it felt very much like... I don't know, that wouldn't happen in, in a book now. Like, it just yeah. you would have some indication that they were numb to the idea or at least like they're aware of it yeah it it, like... it's never even alluded to like you could read into it that they were numb and it, you kind of it they kind of do say that after the fact that they kind of like something like that but like yeah you would never do that it doesn't work is the point like yeah. it, you could do it now but it you have to do it in a way that functions. you would never get it past your editor no they'd be like dog what are you talking about <laughs> and you're like i don't want to i don't want to talk about it yeah yeah it's Arnwood 
<clears throat> rack me over a, 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 oh, a, God, he would. a pan of hot coals and be like, man, he would what? be like, dude, what the fuck? Probably. Well, his email would be like, no, do it again. <laughs> like, do what? And he'd be like, you know what? Um, so to try and wrap this all together, I wanted to read a quote from Patrick Rothfuss, one of my favorite fantasy authors. Uh, he's on the shelf just behind us, Patrick Rothfuss, Name of the Wind. Uh, I wanted to read a quote from Patrick Rothfuss on the difference between the books and the movies for him. Mm-hmm. It's just his opinion. Um, and he says... Without going into any detail, that would be a wholly separate blog post from what he's writing. My main problem with Jackson's ad- my main problem with Jackson's adaptations is that they lose the subtlety of the original stories. It's like this. Tolkien's books were full of subtle tension, drama, action, good characters, and a world of startling, immersive richness. And I couldn't agree more. The books are very much about drama and small drama and small characters and the interplay. And the films are these great, roaring, epic action set pieces, which I yeah. love, but they are so different. It, it works better for film that way, I think. Absolutely. Like Jackson it, did the right thing. Like, there are there are films that devote themselves to, like, small things and, like, talking and stuff, but it, you don't find them in, like, fantasy epics, which have, have those, like, long journeys and, like, action mm. set pieces and stuff. Like, the action is so glossed over in the books. Yeah, because it's not the focus of it. But also, like, prose is such that you can't, like, if you write a really lengthy, uh, like, action set piece, it doesn't work because yeah. violence is quick, so it has to be quick in prose. I mean, how many times have you read a fight scene and been able to keep in your head the movements? Like, th- three times, and because they're short? Yeah. Like, you can probably track, like, I think f- the, r- the rule that we talk about in writing is, like, four to five. So people can track about four to five discrete actions. Then you can trick it by repeating certain ones. Yeah. So you can be like, if someone gets punched in the jaw, then punched again, that cheats it because it's technically one like action. Yeah. But anything like beyond, I think three or four, it just becomes impossible to track. Yeah. And writers are so obsessed with like, you know, trying to render a, a Quentin Tarantino style fight in right, the book. Right. Exactly. That and it's like it's it's, it's illegible because no one can imagine exactly what you're seeing. What's more interesting is the character tension leading into the fight, and the outcome is kind of irrelevant. It's about the drama of it. Um, and I feel like that's something that Tolkien understood intimately. I mean, that's probably why fantasy books focus so much on the internal, like, magic stuff, where, like, you have something like, like, um, Aragorn, where a lot of it's about the internals of, um, Mm. him, like, getting to grips with his magic from, like, a mental perspective. Yeah. Rather than a physical one. Yeah, it was like, it's, that's a very philosophical text. Aragorn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I think that'll do it for Lord of the Rings. Do you have any like closing thoughts that you wanted to touch on before I wrap us up? Oof, what did you, what do you think? What do you reckon going back to it Oof. as a whole from this discussion? Like I I don't know, I think it's pretty okay. Yeah, I mean it's not bad. Um like yeah. there's lots, a reason that about. it's like one of the most well known probably the most well known fantasy yeah. novel of all time. It's the fantasy canon. Like. Right. It, and there's a reason that it kicked off mm-hmm. all of this like idea. Um like all of these archetypes and D and D, basically. Gary Gygax was like, "That's my boy." Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, and like, there's a, so many like interesting ideas because the books are so long. Like, there's so much in them. I can't believe his main criticism was that the first one was too long, <laughs> <laughs> too short. Sorry. Was like, God, <laughs> stop it, Tolkien. You're killing me. Uh... You're killing me, John. Yeah, no, it's it's great. Um, I had a really good time rereading it, and I'm I'm glad that we we touched on it. Um, thank you for listening or watching. Next month we're covering Daughter of Smoke and Bone by Lani Taylor. There will be links in the description wherever you find this for where you can get that. Uh, we're aiming to do these uh, on like the first Sunday of each month. Um, this one is actually going to be that because yay. Well, te- well, no, second. Oh, oh no. We almost nailed it. Last week was kind of a crapshoot, but yeah, so. If you're a patron at patreon.com slash DCMworks, you can get access to a voting poll where you can like try and tell us what you want us to to talk about. And then if you do read it and you want us to respond to your comments on the show, uh, we'll make a master post for that. You can leave your comments on the book of that month and we'll read them out at the end of the show and respond to them and tell you what we think. Um, otherwise, uh, we're on the internet at DCM underscore works pretty much everywhere. Twitter, um, or if you just want to like get to everything, it's dcm.works is our URL. Uh, you can go there and you can find all the other stuff we make. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, if you leave a comment in the comment section, we'll be sure to read it out next month when we cover our next uh, next topic. 
Uh, and if you leave a review on iTunes, we'll probably read it out at some point on something on the Art for Artists podcast, probably. Uh, so if you leave a review, we'll read that out. It really does help us out if you leave a review. Um, helps more people hear what we do. But if you wanted to follow us individually, I'm at DC at my hip pie. I'm at Laura Ducky B. And we'll see you guys next month for Smoke. No, Daughter of Smoke and Bone. I almost said Smoke and Daughter of Bone. <laughs> yeah, cool. See you guys then. Bye. Bye.